Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that the choice was in front of Jesus to call 10,000 angels, and he made that choice to not call them. And we thank you that because he didn't, we're here today. Now, Lord, we want to learn more about him as we open your word. Please help us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you turn now in your Bibles, please, to that chapter after Isaiah 53, chapter 54, Isaiah 54. This is uh, 17 verses where it's going to be the, the, the subject of our meditation this morning. These, first, uh, these 17 verses of Isaiah chapter 54, Isaiah 54, which says, Sing, O barren, thou didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou didst not, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not. Strengthen the cords. Strengthen the stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. Make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. When, the, uh, when thou wast refused, saith the Lord, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but for with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy God. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, thy foundations with sapphires. I'll make thy windows of agates, thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established, thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather themselves together against thee shall fall by thy side. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work that I have created, the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. <clears throat> now, when we come now to this, um, this chapter, chapter 54, we're coming off the mountaintop. We're coming off the mountaintop because we've just completed in, in, in <clears throat> a verse-by-verse, 12-study series on the most important chapter in the Bible, Isaiah 53. I was asked last week, as a matter of fact, why I think why I said that Isaiah 53 is the most important chapter in the Bible. The answer is because God is the most important person in the universe. And Isaiah 53 is the record of God, God's most important work. When God became a man named Jesus Christ and did the work of redemption, that was God's most important work, more important than the creation itself. Everything that follows this chapter, Isaiah 53, comes as a result or benefit from Isaiah 53. These chapters that are the rest of the book of Isaiah, chapter 54 to 66, are the consequences of what Jesus accomplished when he cried out, it's finished. And in, 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 uh, what are the consequences that come as a result of Isaiah 53? It's like all of God's mercies, it's like all of God's goodness were held back by a dam. 
And Isaiah 53 describes the breaking of that dam so that all of God's mercies and his goodness could now overflow to us. God loves to overflow us with mercies and goodness. We see this in Malachi 3.10, Malachi 3.10, where God gave a challenge. And he said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. These are the words that God uses. Pour out, open the windows of heaven. That's the language that God uses to describe how he loads us with his mercies and his goodness. And as, and as for how much mercy and goodness, God says, you won't have enough room to store it, even to receive it. Isaiah 53 was the breaking open of the dam, holding back God's mercies and goodness, as when Jesus said in Luke 6.38, 6.38, Luke 6.38, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that you measure out, with it, it shall be measured to you again. Such a picture of the mercies and goodness of God is putting grain into a basket and then shaking the basket, get a little more, get a little more, and then pressing the grain down to get as much as possible, not caring that grain is lost so much that it's flowing over the side. Now, in order, in order in this first chapter in Isaiah 53, in order to get the impact of Isaiah 53, God has chosen a certain illustration, a certain analogy to drive home a point. It's a very powerful analogy in this 54th chapter of Isaiah. It's a very emotional analogy. It's a very heavy analogy that God has chosen all to drive home for us exactly why Isaiah 53 is so important. By this analogy, God wants to hold our attention very closely. He wants us to use our imagination to picture, to see clearly, to genuinely experience and feel very deeply. And in order to receive this vision that God wants us to give us, we've got to let God use our imagination to imagine. The analogy that he wants us to imagine is a woman in verse 1. A woman who is barren. A woman who in verse 1, verse 1 says, didst not travail with child. A woman in verse 1 who has, quote, the shame of her youth. A woman in verse 1 who has a husband, a woman who is a, verse 6, verse 6, woman forsaken. A woman who is, verse 6, verse 6, refused, rejected. A woman in verse 11, verse 11, who is afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. The book of Isaiah, and for that matter, the whole Bible, is a history of God and his relationship with his people, Israel, the Jewish people. And God has chosen to use this people, Israel, the Jewish people, to represent the world, the whole world. So we look beyond just this historical record of God and the Jews, and we see a historical record of God in the world. We see a historical record of God and you and God and me. Yes, Isaiah 53 is a direct, direct, a direct record, as it says, report, of how God laid on Jesus the transgression of Israel, as stated in Isaiah 53.8, Isaiah 53.8, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. But since Israel stands as the representative of the whole world, God laid on Jesus the sin of the world, as stated in John 1.29. John 1.29, 
Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So when we read in the Bible, we need to see the Bible as how God has set up a play. He set up a play for us. We, as part of the world, we're in the audience. We're in the audience of this theater, and we're seeing this play that God has set up. And on the stage of this play is God as one actor, and the Jewish people, Israel, as the other actor. And through the play, God says, I'm going to teach you through this play who God is. You're going to see who God is. And in Israel, in this play, you're going to see who you are. And the analogy in Isaiah 54, in our chapter, that God wants us to imagine is of a woman, a married woman who was forsaken by her husband. She's refused, she's full of shame, and she has no children. And why is she forsaken? Why is she forsaken by her husband? Because this woman has done the ultimate betrayal against her husband. This woman has been told in Jeremiah 3.1, Jeremiah 3.1, thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Now God says, in order to see the impact of Isaiah 53, use your imagination to just imagine a woman who is, verse 6, verse 6, a wife of youth. Just imagine this verse 6, wife of youth. Just imagine her. She's young. She's beautiful. She's a virgin. She's a young, beautiful virgin bride. And God calls her in Jeremiah 18.31, Jeremiah 18.31, the virgin of Israel. But something very terrible has happened with this young, beautiful virgin bride. And it is Jeremiah 18.31, Jeremiah 18.31, the virgin of Israel hath done a very horrible thing. What's that very horrible thing? That very horrible thing that the young, beautiful virgin wife has done is Jeremiah 3.1, Jeremiah 3.1, thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Now, with that statement, it's like God is saying to us, Selah, Selah. Selah is a word that's used 71 times in the book of Psalms and three times in the book of Habakkuk. That's the only place you'll find it. The vast majority is used in the book of Psalms. The word sila means, the, the word sila means actually, like God says, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what you're thinking about. Stop. Stop now and think about what's just been said. Use your imagination to imagine what's just been said. And so what God is asking us to do in this 54th chapter of Isaiah is sila. Stop. Use your imagination to imagine what's being said here because God is talking about a young, beautiful virgin bride who has decided to do a Jeremiah 18.31, Jeremiah 18.31, very horrible thing as she has decided to do a Jeremiah 3.1, Jeremiah 3.1, play the harlot with many lovers. So let's just seal it then. Let's just seal it then. Let's just stop here and let our imagination go and imagine Imagine a man, a fine man, a man who served his country in the military. And this man met a young, beautiful woman, and he married her. That was the greatest thrill in his, the life of this man. He married that young, beautiful virgin bride. And they got a little house with a garden, and they planned to raise a family together. But right away, this young wife, she got enticed. She was raised kind of protected and sheltered. But she heard of an exciting life that she didn't know anything about. She heard about dazzling places called nightclubs and thrilling places called bars where other men were ready to electrify her senses with ecstatic adventures into realms of just delights she knew nothing about. And she thought about all that. And she, was, and she thought about the, I'm missing that in my life. Just being faithful to one man, it's boring. And the more she thought about what she was missing in the nightlife of the city, the more dissatisfied 
she, she felt in being tied down to her husband in a home. And every day she just yearned to dive into this life of the unhindered, the boldness of the wild, just the audacious of the bear, the thrill of nakedness. And those allurements of the unknown, it so captivated her that she felt like she was suffocating in this married life of being faithful, and she longed just to be able to breathe, breathe free. She felt hindered at home. She felt imprisoned in a life of just cooking meals and making beds. And the world of glitter and the flash was calling to her to break out of the prison of her home and experience this new freedom. But all along this process, her husband is trying to help her. And her husband was especially nice to her and tried to tell her that life in the city at night is dangerous and that she was better to stay at home with him. But all his love and his words, they just, they just were squelched out by the calls of the city. And those calls were, you don't know what you're missing out here with many men who will swoon over you and give you what you cannot even imagine. And she was still very young, and she and her husband, they didn't have any children yet. And when finally she couldn't take the pressure or the pull of the nightlife of the city any longer, she yielded. And imagine her faithful husband watching her return from shopping for clothes. And she took out of her shopping bag the most immodest clothes, very short skirts, low-cut blouses, new perfumes. And imagine her faithful husband in the afternoon watch his wife become excited and happy as she's looking forward to something wonderful is going to happen. And imagine her faithful husband every night watching his wife put on her sexy dresses and those perfumes and then go to the front door and out she went all dressed and nicely smelly for one purpose, to attract men. Imagine her faithful husband watch her as she left every night so happy with the prospect of a new night to have a new thrilling experience. And he watched, he watched this every night with excruciating pain and night after night he waited for her till she returned home and she fell into bed. And day after day and night after night this went on. Day after day and night after night, he patiently waited for her to turn around, change her mind and say that she was so deeply sorry for breaking the vow of her marriage. He had hoped for the day when she would fall into his arms telling him with tears that she had been so wrong and that she was asking for, his, for, her, for, for, for him to forgive her for being a dirty, rotten sinner. But the day never came. The day never came. So finally, he had enough and he left her and he forsook her and he refused her and he rejected her, the unfaithful wife with whom he had no children. And now he's gone. He's gone out of her life. And at first, this seemed to her like a relief to his wife as, as with him gone. She no longer felt the guilt of her unfaithfulness. At first, she felt so free to live so unhindered the life that she always wanted to live. But as time went on, her life of new kicks, it got old. And she got old. And her lovers were no longer so loving toward her. And her life of thrills now had become a life of sadness and internal unrest. She couldn't sleep well at night. She felt so insecure, she became increasingly anxious over her future. She was worrying all the time. She began to feel depressed. She sunk into a state of despair. She became pessimistic. Every little annoyance in life, it just loomed into a fear of she didn't know what, and this fear terrorized her. The slightest problem in life became for her an alarming situation. She was a wreck. And then she began to think of how life was when she was married with her husband, when her husband was by her side, and she realized it was so much better then. Until finally she decided that she had enough of her sinful lifestyle. She just longed, she yearned for the times when she was just married she yearned for that love that, that, that she felt her, from her husband, and, and she felt so secure in that love. She, she longed for that happiness that she had as a new bride. She, she had an ache in her heart for her old life of when she was full of hope and peace. She had it before, 
when her husband stood with her and she had had enough of her old life of being a dirty, rotten sinner. So she stopped and she broke off her old life. She burned those old those clothes, got rid of all those exotic perfumes, and now cut off from her sinful, dirty, rotten friends, old friends, she sits and she hopes for the day when her husband will return to her. She knows she's got nothing in her to attract her husband to ever want her again, to ever want to return to her again. But she remembers he was a good man her husband. And she remembers how long her husband put up with her and all her sins. And so she just hopes and hopes that somehow her husband's going to find in his heart enough mercy to forgive and return to her. So every night, instead of going out on the town, she sits at home right in front of the front door. She stares at the front door. All alone in the house, she sits there, she stares at the front door. And as she stares at the front door, she imagines that she can see the door handle move and that she can see the door open and that she can see her husband returning to her and she imagines how she will run to him and say to him that she sinned against heaven and she sinned against him and that she will say that she only wants to be a maid in his house. She knows that she'll be, she's forfeited the right to be his wife and that she can just be his maid, that, that, that would be okay. So she sits night after night looking at the front door. She sits looking and hoping and crying and yearning, but the door doesn't open, and she goes to bed again exhausted. And you feel her pain. This is the picture God wants to paint for us of the husband who represents God and of the woman who represents first Israel, the Jewish people, and then the woman who re represents all of mankind. Now, finally, the day does arrive when she sees that door handle move, and this is the scene of this first verse in this chapter when God says to the woman in verse 1, verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou that dost not bear. Break forth into singing. Cry aloud. And when her husband opens the door of the house, that's the first thing he says, sing. And the woman says to her husband, you really want to come back to me? You from this picture, God is saying to sobbing Israel, verse 6, verse 6, the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. And that's God saying, yes, I know what I'm doing. I'm calling you back to me, and you are like the woman that I left. You are like the woman refused by her husband, by me. And just as the woman says to her husband, who's returned, it's been such a long time, it's been so very long that you have forsaken me. It's been such a very long time that you've been gone from me. It just it seems like an eternity that I haven't seen your face. And so Israel says to God, it's been so long that I've not had you as my God. It's been so long that I've been forsaken by God. It's been so long that I've not seen the face of God. It's been so long that I've seen one holocaust after another. And so God responds to Israel by saying, it's just a small moment. Just a moment. Verse 7, verse 7. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a, in a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with everlasting kindness have I mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And really, for the times in our lives in which we were without God, as described in Ephesians 2.12, Ephesians 2.12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, for that time period in our lives, when we were without Christ in our lives, it just seemed so long. But when compared to eternity, it was just a verse 7 small moment. Not to be compared with eternity. Like all of our present health problems, all of our emotional distresses, when compared to what God is going to make us enjoy for eternity, no comparison. Romans 8.18, Romans 8.18. I reckon that the 
sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And just as this woman can't believe that her husband has actually returned to her, a dirty, rotten sinner that she's been, so God explains why he has decided to come back to Israel. And God tells Israel that the reason he has come back is because he has great mercies and everlasting kindness in verse 7. Verse 7, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And God says to Israel that whereas in the past, yes, he had forsaken them, but now, no, he's returned to them, in verse 8, as their redeemer. And so God returns to Israel. He tells them he couldn't forget. He couldn't forget. He was a part, but he couldn't forget. Romans 11, 1, Romans 11, 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. God hath not cast away his people who he foreknew. Even though Israel has been the unfaithful wife to God, and God and, and, and Israel forgot God. She forgot God. But God said, never forgot Israel. Isaiah 49, 15. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. And the fact that God never forgot Israel drove God to eventually come back and call Israel. Just as when the man returned to his unfaithful wife, he had... He had to be able to process the past. He had to be able to have assurance for the future that this was not going to happen again. So it was with God. Past sins had to be dealt with. And changes needed to be made to assure that the future was not going to be like the past. God's anger over past sins had to be vented off. Judgment had to fall for the previously unfaithful wife, Israel, to now be accepted. And God's way to deal with the past for his anger to be vented off was for God to vent his anger on another person. God's way to put an end of our past sins was for judgment to fall on another person. That's Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is God venting his anger on another person so that sinful souls can be accepted by him. Isaiah 53 is God pouring out the judgment that was due us so that we can be united again to God. That covers the past, but that's not all because now there comes a great change in life and the change is described in verse 14. Verse 14, in righteousness shalt thou be established. God promises a righteousness that's not her own. This brings us back to that great work that Jesus Christ did and the distinction between these all too important Hebrew words, tzaddik and tzaddak. Isaiah 53, 11, Isaiah 53, 11. So shall my righteous tzaddik servant justify tzaddak many. Jesus is the righteous tzaddik servant and Jesus makes us righteous, tzaddak. Tzaddak means to make righteous. Tzaddik means righteous. This is what God did for Abraham when God put, his, when, 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 when God put into Abraham his righteousness after Abraham put his faith and trust in God. Genesis 15, 6, Genesis 15, 6. He believed in the Lord and he counted him for righteousness. Abraham put his faith in the Lord and the Lord, tzaddak, made Abraham righteous which is a great subject in the book of Romans called the righteousness by faith. Righteousness refers to the past as never sinned. Righteous means never soiled. Righteousness means never tarnished. Righteousness means never did the sin. And when God, Sadak makes us righteous, that means that God makes us as if we had never sinned, as if we were never tarnished, this was why to be tzaddak or made righteous is, is better and different from being just pardoned or forgiven. It's better. As we said, if David was only pardoned or forgiven, then he would be known as the person who was a dirty, rotten sinner 
but is now pardoned. If David was only pardoned, then David would be known as, in heaven as, oh yeah, there's that guy who, in the past, raped a wife and murdered her husband, but he's pardoned. But because David is tzedak, or made righteous, that means David was made as though he never did that. So in heaven, when the question is asked, isn't that David who raped a wife and murdered her husband? Because David is tzedak, made righteous, the answer is, we can't remember any rape or murder. What are you talking about? Because God says that after he was Sadak, that God makes a person righteous, and therefore, that being righteous, it's an Isaiah 43, 25 affair. Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Can't remember it. Isaiah 38, 17, Isaiah 38, 17, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Can't see him. Micah 7, 9, Micah 7, 9, Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Can't find them. Psalm 103, 12, Psalm 103, 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us, they're removed. To beat Sadak or made righteous means rape and murder. Can't remember. Can't see. Behind my back. Can't find them in the depths of the sea. Don't know where east meets west. That's the power of Sadak. Far better than just being forgiven or pardoned. Sadak is to be made righteous as if never sinned. And when Isaiah 53, 11 tells us that Jesus is the righteous one and that he will make us righteous, that means that we shall become like him. So shall my righteous servant make righteous many. 1 John 3, 2, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When that verse in 1 John 3, 2 says, we shall be like him, that means that he's going to make us like him. He's going to make us righteous because of Isaiah 53, 11. He's the righteous servant, and he will, Tzedak, make us righteous. And he's already started this work. He's already started this work in us. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's what it means to be tzedak, or made righteous. It's a process for the future of changing us to be like Jesus Christ, but even more important, it's a cancellation of all of our past sins. It's like there's a great, grand supercomputer in heaven, and that supercomputer has a record of all of our sins, and when we put our faith and trust in Christ, God takes all of our files and that it contain all of the records of our sins, and he hits one button on the keyboard. That's the delete button. They're gone. To dock means all of the files of our sins are deleted. No more record. That's what it means in Isaiah 54, 14, in verse 14, in righteousness shalt thou be established. That Hebrew word translated established is the word kun, and it means to stand upright. With all of our sins in the past, even if we were just pardoned and forgiven, couldn't stand upright in heaven. Oh yeah, it was the guy who raped the wife, murdered her husband. But because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, that Isaiah 53, 11 verse, so shall my tzaddik, righteous servant, justified tzaddak, make righteous many. Tzaddak means that all of our files of our sins are deleted, and it enables us to, verse 14, verse 14, in righteousness shall thou stand upright. And who's responsible for this righteousness that we're made, Sadak? Verse 17, verse 17, their righteousness comes from me. Their righteousness is of me. And that means that when Satan forms weapons against us, which are the weapons of our sins, our records, where Satan brings up our past sins as a weapon against us to weaken us, make us feel guilty, God says in verse 17, verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, their righteousness is of me. And, when, and because God has made us sadak, righteous, when Satan comes to us and reminds us 
of the sins of our past. Satan says to us, you should be ashamed of yourself. God says to us, verse 4, verse 4, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, for thou shalt not be put to shame. Thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. And when Satan brings up our past sins as a weapon against us that he tries to use with God to get God to be against us, God says in verse 17, verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, their righteousness of me. And when a voice of condemnation is formed against us because of our past sins, that weapon is neutralized because of Isaiah 53, 11, that Christ the righteous Sadiq has Sadak made us righteous with his, with his past death and his present intercession. Romans 8, 34, Romans 8, 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And then God continues to use the analogy of the woman who was adulterous, who was forsaken, who was rejected, and did repent of her adulteries and was called back by her husband to be his faithful wife. And using this analogy, God calls on us again, use your imagination to imagine, where God says, imagine that this woman has no children and she's called in verse 1, the barren, the desolate, speaking about her having no children. Imagine this children wants children so much, and she's so sad over not having any children of her own. And God says to this sad woman with no children, in verse 1, verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou dost not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou dost not travail with child. And the woman represents Israel. The woman represents the Israel of God, the believing Israel, and the Jewish people who believe in Jesus. And imagine the woman saying to God, I have no spiritual children of my own. I've tried to bring my own Jewish people to Christ and have children, uh, uh, spiritual children of my own, but they won't come. They just said to me, I'd rather go to hell than to believe in Jesus. I'm a total failure when it comes to having children from my own Jewish people. I'm barren, I'm desolate. That's the Jewish believers in Christ. They've said to God, Look, you're my spiritual husband, God, and we should have spiritual children together, but none of my Jewish family has come to Christ. None are my, none are my children that have been born again. And God says to the small Jewish remnant that believe in Christ, and they see they have no fruit from their own Jewish people. They feel so barren. They feel so desolate. God says to them, verse 1, More are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. God says in verse 1 to this Jewish remnant who believe in Jesus, start to sing because you're going to have so many children, you better start to prepare because your house is way too small. So immediately, you better start a house enlargement project with many, 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 many rooms. Verse 2, verse 2, enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy inhabitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth from the right hand and the left hand. And then she says to God, why, where are all these children going to come from? Who are all these children? And God says to her in verse 3, verse 3, thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. And God is telling the Jewish remnant that instead of the Jews coming to Christ, it'll be the Gentiles that come to Christ. They will, there will be a flood of Gentiles coming to Christ, and that's what we've seen in history, and that's what Romans 11, 11 says. Romans 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, then diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Acts 13, 42, Acts 13, 42. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And then we can imagine the woman who represents, again, the small number of Jewish believers saying to God, Gentiles? I'm going to have Gentile spiritual children? Are you, God, really able to bring Gentiles to believe in the God of Israel, to believe in Okay, and God just said amen. <laughs> and to that question, God replies in verse 5, verse 5, Thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. And the Hebrew in verse 5 of thy maker is thine husband is interesting because 
Both those words, maker and husband, are literally in the Hebrew in the plural. It says, thy makers are thy husbands. That's referring to the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are the makers. All three are the husbands. And yet they are all one, as stated in Deuteronomy 6.4. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then God speaks about children. You know, when a child is born, there's always a big question as to who that child will grow up to be. How many times have I heard people say, I don't want to push uh, religion down the throat of my child. They'll just let him grow up and make his own choice. If there was one thing, if there was one thing that a parent could do that would guarantee that a child would grow up and definitely have for the rest of its life a life of sadness, a life of unrest, a life of not being grateful, feeling entitled, feeling cheated, a life of insecurity, a life of anxiety, a life of worry, a life of conflict, a life of depression, a life of hopelessness, a life of fear, of bondage, of apprehension, of being discontent, of feeling terrorized and pessimistic. Or if there's one thing that a parent could do that would guarantee that a child would grow up and definitely have for the rest of his life a life of happiness and contentment and gratitude and security and confidence and joy and peace and gladness and hope and a boldness and a, a freedom and assurance and feel satisfied and, a, and optimistic. And the Bible says there's one thing that a parent can do or not do that makes the difference. And it's verse 13, verse 13. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. Teach children about Jesus Christ to give them great peace for the rest of their lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for being such a great God that takes us back. In Jesus' name, amen.